volatile and damage prone. Businesses have armies of lawyers they can use to press the interests of consumers. What consumers need is, an access, is access to compensation that is meaningful they can get, which is what such open government gives you. Four, but five conclusions in this speech. First, the system set up, then explaining why it is necessary to introduce this scheme now, then explaining why this is good for consumers, then for business practices, and finally some mitigation as to why the price of the goods services don't become so extortionate as to move any benefit. First on setup, we think this scheme is likely to work in the way that it will in the interest wise. That is to say that it is a, you do not have to prove fault in order to access this interest. The main thing to say is that this works across every single instance of AI operating that consumers engage with. That, uh, that is to say, for example, in the interest wise, will also be like in the medical industry, say, for example, where AI is used to target medical imaging. The third thing to say is that this is likely to be used to settle claims that compensate customers in instances where they suffer harm as a result of AI. Uh, of AI. And the third thing, the third thing to say is to explain why. Uh, that companies don't necessarily often even know what these sorts of things in the first instance. For the reason I was explaining in my argument about consumers, that is to say that it is far easier to try and prove that a consumer is at fault, especially because that consumers generally interface with AI, and that is simple as that. First argument in this speech then, explaining why it is absolutely necessary to do this now, I'll make two observations. The first is that the consumer mood around AI is particularly heavy, and it is viewed as something that is new and volatile and quite scary, and that is different from the services that consumers traditionally engage with, which means that the government has a large amount of support to do this well, to do this in a way that is particularly well resourced, and to, and to really force these things to opt in. And the second thing to say is that companies are unlikely to do this at this point because AI is particularly volatile, uh, and, and is kind of like damage prone, so this is something they're likely to opt into. What this means is it's absolutely essential to do this now, because in the future, trying to get other methods of trying to get them into like opting a, a, a regulation and consumer conversations with AI is likely to be at far higher levels of approval just when AI is more developed down the track and is better able to take away some of these things that happen. And I would note at the end of this as well that we have like the fiat to make sure that everyone opts in. So that's something we have to prove. Uh, second argument in this speech about why this is really good for consumers. The important frame here is that AI has lots of volatility associated with it, which means that it's likely to lead to a lot of, com of damages that occur to the people that interface with it that use it that necessarily need to be compensated. Obviously, this isn't always like driverless cars crashing and killing people, although that is a real harm that does exist. But it's also being like medical imaging technology not interpreting a scan properly, or some of it, or, or getting like shunted with the pricing of goods because the AI metric is fed data badly. And these things are necessarily bad that consumers uh, should be able to access compensation for it. But without these no fault insurance like compensation schemes, companies uh, try to absorb themselves even if they are very clearly at fault. Because it is far easier to throw your resources at consumers and tell them uh, that they are the ones at fault, which has a serious incentive to do that. Yeah. And we should note that it just principally should be possible for consumers to seek recompense from these companies. For the reason that they are responsible for the harm, because they're the ones that developed the AI and put consumers there in the first place. They do have a responsibility, a responsibility to remedy them. Why is it then that companies are able to try and blame consumers and put them at fault and do develop them successfully that means you necessarily need a no fault insurance scheme? Well, first to say uh, that there is just a, a power imbalance that exists between companies and consumers in that they have far like, bigger teams of lawyers, they have far more money, they can do things like intimidate you, they can do things uh, like that. But the second thing to say is that legal regulation and frameworks around AI just tend to be lag 10 or 15 years behind technology because it's very slow and bureaucratic to pass the right. and as legislators and even the people developing AI tend not to understand super comprehensively how that works. So what that means is that corporations with their armies of lawyers are able to exploit loopholes in other people's legal frameworks to make it hard to get things. The third thing to say is that uh, given that consumers interface with AI, it's likely that you can blame a certain degree of harm on user error and deflect the necessary amount of fault onto consumers so as to demonstrate that like, you are not at fault for the harm and therefore don't have to compensate them. Um, we would say that like, uh, with uh, a no fault insurance scheme, given that the insurer will cover like damages that is caused, consumers are therefore able to access that recompense and this is the only way in which they're able to seek damages. This is incredibly impactful and you ought to aim particularly highly. It is bad for companies to be able to victimize consumers and blame them for things they are responsible for with AI and deprive them of damages. It is likely to be particularly bad. We all weigh very highly in this debate because consumers are the most vulnerable stakeholder. They are the biggest stakeholder. Everyone is a consumer of goods and services. We all weigh that particularly highly. We all not let companies get away with particularly hurtful behavior. Say, uh, before I move on, I'll just come to the podium. How many 
you generally have power back imbalances over there consumers to blame them for faults? So why are you making this unique to AI? That's what this motion is. Like <laughs> <laughs> Do a lot of things in this space. One thing they consistently fail to do is there any attempt to prove is their burden, which is to prove that it's moral to make people pay for things that they have done and impose the costs on the people who actually behave responsibly with AI and try to take those costs away from the people who are misusing it, which is obviously a reason this is a bad idea. I'm going to start with some setup. So there's a couple of things to note here. Firstly, our current model is that we, we would still we would require insurance for AI, but we would keep it fault based, which is largely the status quo, noting that, for example, rideshare companies that require car insurance. There's already business insurance. There's already liability and indemnity insurance. We would simply apply that to AI. Where there are perhaps potentially gaps in the legislation that OG identified, we would be happy to fill them with new laws and new precedents establishing that businesses and you know, CEOs and all the board members and the shareholders, etc., just as they are in the status quo, are responsible for harms caused by AI that they develop and knowingly release onto the market. So we can still hold them liable in that sense. I would note that it's pretty easy to assign AI faults to a company. The second thing to note in setup is just a, a basic explanation of sort of how insurance works, but just to make it very clear to the debate, make it very clear what we're talking about. So insurance, you, make, you pay premiums based on risk factors that determine you know, how, the, how the company assesses you as likely to cost them money if they have to pay out to cover you. There are, if the event occurs, 
that pay out the premium damages. Now, importantly, there are two different types of insurance. There's third party no fault insurance, where, uh, where what happens is you, know, you drive your car into someone else, they use their insurance to take money from your insurance rather than you directly, you as a first person. We think it's more important, we think, and then first, person, first party insurance obviously is directly seeking compensation for you. We think that is the kind of thing that is much more effective if you care about holding companies to account, making sure that they don't misuse AI. I think it's also important, uh, yeah. The other thing I'll open set up just briefly is just sort of responding to the, I guess, attempt to set up the debate as like, oh, it's really difficult for, people, for people to like sue these big companies and get uh, assigned direct liability, which they use to kind of preempt that case. I would note firstly, a huge portion of this is done for things like class actions, because lots of people use AI-based apps like Uber, for example. Lots of people get facially, like racially profiled by AI facial recognition algorithms, which means it's usually relatively easy to draw up a relatively large number of people who can chip in things like a class action to get a good lawyer and prove harm on a pretty wide scale that's very noticeable, which means it's unclear that in most of our cases, the power imbalance that I described exists to that degree. Secondly, I would note that this is AI. Like, it has an algorithm behind it that you can actually assess, and there are like more legal experts who are capable of doing this. It's not like a, you know, a business discriminating on a human level where it's quite hard to prove intent, for example. You can literally read the code, like the code written into the algorithm and determine it was set up in a way that is structurally likely to, for example, price down right. people who live in particular geographic areas. It is particularly likely to try and advertise people for predatory things in ways that you know, materially harm their lives. The third thing I would just note though is that there is also a massive barrier on the government bench because even under a no-fault insurance scheme, you, st you still have to actually prove there was harm through things like existing statutes and torts. This is Point. obviously something that these big scary legal teams are very capable of quibbling over. So if you, can, if you believe that there is a barrier, it is one that is relatively symmetric and relatively marginal, open government aren't going to be able to win the debate on that setup alone. Two standard arguments from our opening opposition. Firstly, on the principle that responsible parties should pay, which is a very important principle that the Chief Society brings. And secondly, on introducing moral hazard and encouraging worse behavior under this system. Uh, sure, I'll open it. Yeah, if AI has so many intelligible algorithms that we can easily edit, why do you think being strawberry has two R's? Well, yeah, like, that, that's a pretty really good reason why you don't want companies behaving irresponsibly, which I'm about to explain that your model encourages them to do. So, Firstly, on the principle that responsible parties should pay, uh, the first reason for this is just like the most basic moral principle of intuition that like six-year-olds can work out. If you cause harm to someone else, the onus is on you to pay reparations, not to appeal to a third party to repair that damage who didn't, who didn't do anything wrong. You do, not, you do not have the right to impose the cost of what your, of your bad behavior onto somebody else to clean up. That's why, for example, like if you get drunk at the social, it's not equity's responsibility to come in and fix the situation. You get punished for that. Secondly, I would note that this aligns incentives and creates a deterrent for bad behavior because, importantly, there is a significantly higher cost of direct liability in no-fault insurance. And the reason for that is that in, with direct liability, you get insurance premiums that are targeted to you specifically as an actor based on your risk factors, based on your past behavior, which is why the am set up about you don't feel like there's a deterrent on their side doesn't make sense. The whole point of a no-fault insurance scheme is that there are not risk premiums under it because everyone contributes regardless of how likely they are to end up having to, having to make a claim against that insurance company. When there are lots of people contributing, that reduces the individual financial burden on each one of those companies and how much they have to pay. Whereas if you get sued directly for large-scale damages, that is an enormous financial cost, which makes it obviously a much stronger deterrent than in one in which they ship in the same amount of money regularly to the, to the collective no-fault insurance fund, uh, which is obviously significantly worse. So obviously the, the, like, the actual deterrent of, in terms of financial risk is significantly higher under the system that we propose. Thirdly, I would note that it's particularly true in the system, uh, it's particularly true that you should be responsible for your own actions when we're talking about AI. Like you could maybe make a principled case for why having third party no fault insurance is such like a good idea for driving, because like lots of people make their own cars and function in a modern society. But this isn't a like if you're introducing like AI chips into society, that is not a necessary thing. That is something that the business is choosing to do. Obviously, if you are experimenting with this technology, which as OG helpfully characterized, you know is risky, you have a particularly strong obligation to make sure it works and to be at that fault if you fuck up. I think if you look at the weighing of this is relatively straightforward. Maybe it is true in principle that like, you know, it's true that we care about consumers, but I've just explained why consumers are more likely to get better at behavior from, from these AI corporations in our world. And importantly, if you think there is some like, relatively marginal change in that, it is certainly then immoral, you can certainly weigh this as a contribution to OO, that it is immoral to punish the AI companies that act responsibly by making them pay significant amounts of money into a no-fault insurance scheme compared to a world in which there's direct liability, they don't do anything wrong, they don't get sued, they don't get punished for the sins of other people. Second argument on moral hazard. 
So firstly, I've already kind of explained why there is a much massively reduced cost of not complying with the standards in their world. So knowing that companies balance risk and reward, for example, with algorithmic price gouging, they work out, you know, if we do this, it'll make a fair bit of money, but there's also a risk of getting caught, a risk of bad PR, et cetera, et cetera. They align the risk, the behavior, the incentives of these companies significantly more in favor of the reward because the risk is actually much lower, right? You pay, it's like no fault insurance is a much lower financial burden on these companies than direct liability insurance, which means they're obviously more likely to do things. Uh, secondly, though, I, I don't think this likely means that insurance prices are likely to be inaccurate or misallocated. Because no fault, no fault insurance means you get less data on liability, so you don't, you're less able to tell which companies are actually risky. You're less able to tell which companies are the ones who are likely to be bad actors. So you might want to do things like raise premiums on. Secondly, you have to pay out for a lot of stupid stuff that, that, that where, you know, otherwise it would be the fault of that particular party, and insurance wouldn't need to cover it. The impact of that is that you get higher costs because insurance companies need to hedge their risk. They need to make sure that they're not are going to be paying out more than they're expecting to on like their account sheets. The impact of that is firstly, safe people who don't want to use this, who like don't make claims regularly, get punished with higher costs, which is obviously immoral and bad thing, because then it hinders their ability to do things like innovate and employ people. But secondly, it means that risky and worse customers take out more insurance claims, which is obviously a financial risk for this insurance company. It increases the risk of them going under and leaving far more people without coverage. It decreases the amount that they're able to pay out to people who could genuinely harm, which is obviously a disaster for us. Firstly, dismantling the opening opposition claim on shirking moral responsibility. Let's firstly explain why these companies do have the moral responsibility, to pay, uh, why it is fair to force them to pay, even if they are not at fault. Secondly, why their account actually fails on their own burden. And finally, questioning why this is even important. Firstly, on why it is fair to force these companies to engage in no-fault compensation schemes. No fault compensation schemes. Firstly, because they own the profits of AI integration, which explains why if they are getting all of the reward from integrating AI, they should be responsible for some of the cost, and we're happy to make them opt into that with the no fault insurance scheme. Secondly, because they have shirked responsibility from when they used to get humans to do it. For example, we used to have human researchers do medical AI imaging testing, and now we get AI to do it. If that doesn't mean that the company is no longer responsible for it, if they were previously responsible for it being done under old systems, they should be responsible for it being done under new systems. Just because when technology evolved to get computers, we said, oh, well, now the future Using computers so we can't force them to pay their share of the thing doesn't make sense. As technology evolves, if these companies are still integrating it and using to replace their pre-existing systems, that means they should still be liable for it. But finally, AI is a trade of consumer data, which explains why it is impossible to opt out of the system they describe. No one was able to consent to ChatGPT being trained on the billions of data since it was being trained on. Those were generated by consumers, which explains why it is the burden on companies to be able uh, to be opting into these no-fault insurance schemes instead, which is why their analogy about like, well, well, we force you to pay no fault compensation schemes for cars, because that's, we, because that's something everyone needs, but AI is only selectual, does not apply. No one was asked whether they would like to select into having their personal data used to train these AI models. It is unfair to suggest that they should select out of having those that uh, risk covered for them. But their kind of actual fails on their own burden in a few ways. Firstly, their claim is we would encourage people to do fault compensation schemes instead, so that then the, like, the parties at fault could pay. But that is up naive. Firstly, because society has been coerced into accepting the terms and conditions of these AI companies. For the reason that often they are the only service provider in their industry, which means that you are forced into opting into those into companies that are integrated with AI, which means that maybe consumers tick a box, but they have an exceptionally hollow choice as to whether they opt into these kind of things, which means that the company is uh, a company has a predatory ability to concentrate on the uh, to uh, have AI work in pernicious ways, and consumers can't do anything about it, which explains why they're very unable they're unable to sue because often the terms and conditions say things like you can't hold us responsible for the use of this AI, even if actually they were at fault because they don't have another alternative they could go to that maybe says, actually, we are having to properly claim the blame for AI. But secondly, we can't tell AI algorithms to edit themselves. This is a lie from opening opposition. And I see why I explain this. If we understood the ways that ChatGPT and our other, obviously we understand the ways in which they come to decisions, but we cannot edit those decisions because we cannot squeeze the toothpaste back into the tube of which the, with the data points we have given them, which explains why 
I I have to fucking know how many R's are in the letter word strawberry, and we can't get it to work it out. And it keeps making the same mistakes. We can't edit these AI algorithms, so it is true that these integration uh, means that, that companies uh, these companies are at fault. But thirdly, we give you several reasons why they're unable to, for the reason that they often have legal teams that are very large and very well resourced that exploit loopholes in lagging in lagging legislation that means that consumers do not have the ability to go at people, go after people who are at fault. To explain how a no fault contra- uh, fault based compensation scheme fails consumers because they are unable to target the people that are at fault. They say that oh, like maybe this is uh, they 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 try to ta- just hand wave away at this and say that that's unimportant. But we say that even if you do not believe that that is true in every single instance, consumers are preemptively dissuaded from having these litigations having these litigations because they feel as though they will not be able to pay any compensation given that the odds are so stacked against them. So we empower consumers to take that decision and mean that they're able to go after these claims. That is the reason why a no a false compensation based scheme fails on their own metrics. So if you believe that principle is important in the debate, they cannot win on it. But finally, I actually question whether this is important. We have no fault compensation schemes insurances in other cases, like how Prince and Jack. And the distinction they try to draw, which is like, well, everyone needs a car, which is why we have a no fault compensation scheme, that AI is isolated to specific industries, is untrue. AI is integrating and AI is changing the way that we operate in almost all sectors of society. The choice to opt out of using AI is incredibly hollow and often one that consumers are not able to make. So it's unfair to say that that is the this moral distinction between us mandating no fault compensation schemes and fault compensation schemes. But as I already flagged, AI has been trained non-consensually on consumer data, which explains why it is a society-wide obligation to protect people from AI, even though they have kind of un- uh, non-consensually for- enforced a shift into the development of it. That knocks out the opening opposition case, even if you believe that that is an important moral burden, they fail on it, and we explain why we get better rights for consumers. So let's now talk about whether businesses are better able to mitigate the harms on our side. Their case is that businesses are, will now do worse behavior because they're not going to be found as false as such. Firstly, obviously, if you are found to do consistent, uh, you are having consistent successful or out claims made against you, that means that your insurance premiums would rise, which explains why you would not have an incentive to do that. But we explained that the AI market because it's growing in size is becoming more competitive. So businesses obviously still have all of the pre-existing reasons to act up in the interest of say, up in the interest of trying to make their services better because they don't want to be known as the company that does a really shit job of things, which is why they would obviously have reasons to do uh, try to make their business practices better as well. But we give a number of reasons as to why businesses actually can permanently mitigate these harms. Firstly, oh yeah. Um, you just didn't you just explain that there are reputational consequences to your AI being bad? Is that not sufficient enough in a very competitive market like you described to prevent the misuse or the, the poor application of AI? Well, no, because it, we need to we need, like if you believe that you can like people would be dissuaded by reputation, we have already explained why their reputation would not be harmed if you were able to successfully prove that you were not at fault, which is what would happen under their side. And because we've explained that businesses in almost every single instance, even when they are at fault, are able to prove in a legal context that they are not because of the level of risk and asymmetry and the fact that they exploit legal loopholes. That means they don't find a significant reputational damage. But when we shift the mindset of the society to say, it is your fault if, you're, if the AI that you have integrated off of into and confident offer has harmed people, that is a significant, uh, that is a significant, far more significant situation. But additionally, this stops them from integrating prematurely, which we think is bad. So if you believe that AI is a useful tool to have in society, it's bad when it integrates things prematurely and they don't work out, which happens a lot and we're able to dissuade a lot of that bad behavior. But also, they can tailor their, their usage of AI and integration of AI into their organizations by doing things like employing cybersecurity professionals or doing things like te- uh, employing testing teams to rigorously test the AI with their area of expertise, which means that they're able to mitigate for a lot of the risks which, as I've explained, they would be less likely to do under their side. Finally, on the cost of consumers, we explained that, they, uh, we explained that the cost of consumers, uh, the cost is not plus on consumers for a number of reasons. Firstly, because businesses don't want to lose consumers to competitors. Secondly, because they want consumers to get comfortable with AI, because we'd be likely to try and price these terms at a, at a price point that would still be good for consumers and entice them to use these services. And finally, because as AI becomes cheaper and cheaper to integrate, as it becomes better and better, that means they're more easily able to absorb the cost of using AI. But I also urge you to think about the other costs of consumers that are not monetary. Firstly, the perception of AI being unsafe if they are unable to file successful lawsuits against them and have any fault driven onto these companies. The harm to the development of AI could be incredibly useful into the future because consumers become scared of it. And the, the, the damage to the consumers occur when they're unable to access the uh, conversations that should have been rightfully afforded to them vote for opening government. <laughs>
through a false sense of future existence, companies are required to pay out when they cause a harm and they are found at fault for causing that harm. To a no fault insurance scheme, companies must pay out even when they are not at fault for the harm. And obviously, the status quo has a variety of forms of insurance that companies are required to have professional indemnity insurance, business insurance, insurance for specific kinds of tasks. And as we point out in our model, we'd be quite happy to require companies involved in AI to take out forms of insurance that are not currently mandated. The question that I still have not had answered after 14 minutes of analysis from a big government is why should a company pay out money for a harm that it's not at fault for, that it didn't cause, that it's not responsible for? That is what opening government and closing government need to prove, and none of the analysis we get ever answers that one question, which is why opening opposition will win. <coughs> Firstly, let's deal with the principle clash in this debate. Opening government claims they give you a bunch of principled reasons why companies have an obligation to pay, but I would note all of these are actually reasons why companies have an obligation to pay when they are at fault, not reasons to pay when they aren't at fault. I.e., they say, well, companies earn profits from doing this. If they're responsible before, they should be. You can't opt out of AI. Companies are predatory. Yeah, all great reasons why when a company does something bad to you, when it causes a harm, they should have to pay, which occurs in the status quo and under opening opposition. The question is, what about when they are not at fault? What about when the user fucks up? Why is that a reason for the AI to have to pay? No explanation. Secondly, they say, well, we can't know what the AI was thinking, therefore it should be a no-fault system. Well, why do we need to know what the AI is thinking? Like, we're perfectly happy to concede that AI sometimes makes mistakes on side of opening opposition. The question is just like, when the AI makes mistakes, that is fault, therefore you would pay out under a fault-based insurance scheme. The self-driving car crashes, that's the company at fault. Like, vicarious liability exists. If your employee, including <coughs> AI agent, does something that is wrong, then yes, obviously the company should be responsible and should pay out. The question is, when it is not at fault, why should it pay out? Never answered. Finally, they say there is a society-wide obligation to protect people from AI. Sure, why is it discharged by this very bizarre mechanism of holding companies responsible for things that they didn't do? But surely it's a reason to say have regulation, which we support, to say have a fault-based insurance scheme, which we support. None of this analysis ever explains why companies should be responsible. And we give you a very clear principle, which is just that people should be responsible for things that they cause and not responsible for things that they don't cause, which is something even a 12-year-old could intuit. It is theft to force companies to pay for things that are not their fault. It would be good for consumers to just like let people steal from Walmart, but obviously that is immoral and it is never explained why that should be allowed. Secondly, let's talk about business practices. Because this team point. says this will be good and encourage companies to do useful things like not prematurely implement bad AI systems. That is true of the opening opposition case as well. If you implement a bad AI system, it will be found at fault for causing harm, you will pay out money. That incentive is entirely symmetric. They don't give any additional incentive by forcing you to pay out the, the AI not causing problems. Like That just deters you from doing business in the first place because you're being punished for something that's not your fault. Secondly, they say people will be scared of AI. One, this team seems to hate AI in the first place. It's unclear why they think this is a harm. But secondly, obviously people will not be scared of AI in a world where they know any time the AI causes them harm, they will be able to get compensation. So that is symmetric. The one kind of get out of jail free card is to attempt to claim, well, the problem is that companies, oh, people can never win these cases when the company is at fault. So you just need to force a company to pay out regardless of fault. And that's the only way legitimately harm people can be compensated. Here are six responses. Firstly, there are PR incentives to pay out when you have caused harm. The media will report on it. It will be terrible. You will lose in a competitive market. Secondly, there is lots of regulation on the insurance industry. There is an ombudsman. There are regulators. There's financial services like uh, ombudsman, for example, which you can go to. It makes it very easy to file a complaint. Thirdly, there are well-established reasons for the most common types of harm, like medical malpractice, bad financial advice, motor vehicle accidents, etc. All which mean it's very easy to win these cases. Four, lawyers will take them on contingency and you can use class actions. Five, there are electoral pressures on governments where people are being screwed over continuously by business. Regulators crack down. There are strong reasons to care. There is strong state capacity to do things about this. Finally, though, if it is the case that it's truly impossible to ever win these cases, opening government doesn't help consumers either because you would still obviously need to demonstrate causation, even if not fault, because you would have to demonstrate the harm you've suffered is related to the AI in the first place, and not just you fell down the stairs the day before, and the company could just dispute that form of causation. And if companies just win every court case automatically, they would just win those court cases as well, and this team wouldn't be able to help them. If it's the case that the rules on causation are so lax that you can automatically just claim any harm must have been caused by the AI and they won't ask questions, that explains why the system is immediately watered by every con man in town who's able to point to any harm that might have occurred at any time and say an AI system did it and claim money out of corporations, which immediately just kind of like, you know, destroys the viability of any AI-related business. So, clearly that doesn't work. That takes out any benefit opening government has, yes. 
Uh, why don't you support no fault insurance schemes for car drivers? LO says you do, but your analysis says only the person responsible for the crash should pay. Oh, Sam spoke. That's not the case in this guy's quote. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about the harm that this team must face. Firstly, this raises costs on business. Because you now require businesses to pay out when they haven't done anything wrong. That's just like a whole bunch of money that they have to pay out for no particular reason. Obviously, that will raise costs. This team gives you like four or five reasons why costs don't go up, none of which matter. Like, yes, competition exists, yes, people like cheap stuff, et cetera, et cetera, true. But like, companies aren't gonna make a loss, so if the costs go up, obviously the prices are gonna go up. M magic money doesn't spout out of the middle of nowhere, obviously prices go up. And that is more important than this team's argument, because it affects everyone, it affects innocent people, and it probably affects people in more important ways. Things like people having more expensive groceries or necessities that are increasingly more likely to be integrated with things like AI shopping services, which means they don't get their basic needs met, whereas their benefits may be slightly easier for some people to be able to claim some form of compensation from companies in the first place. Secondly though, this is bad for uh, incentives of companies, because now there's no incentive for companies to be safer, because being safer doesn't actually reduce your insurance premiums, because at-fault claims will represent a very small portion of total payouts, and no-fault payouts will represent a much larger function of payouts. So being safer in status quo means you spend less on insurance premiums, so strong incentive to do it. At the moment, because often you're just paying out money when you didn't even do anything wrong, the incentive to be safer goes down. But thirdly, it's really bad for insurance markets. Because insurance markets re rely on very strong price signals to be able to determine how risky particular products are and how to price that insurance. One, far less data is collected now because you don't go into the work of determining who is at fault for various things which is useful in allocating the specific risk to different actors, but two, you get large amounts of adverse selection due to that problem with pricing. We're safer actors, uh, we're the most dangerous actors now, who don't have any scrutiny placed upon them when claims are made, are able to get very cheap insurance and then file huge numbers of claims, which means insurance firms are far more likely to collapse and people who really need access to things like compensation are far less likely to get it. Look, at the end of the debate, the question is very simple. Does government ever explain to you why something you are not responsible for, you did not call should be your problem to deal with. No. Thank you, Nilo. Uh, I would like to welcome the Gov member to the closing half of this debate. We explain, we will explain why it's likely for companies to exploit AI poorly, filling in the gap in opening government. Then we will discuss AI development, its highest impact and most important part of this debate. Firstly, what, why are companies likely to exploit AI poorly? And I don't open government rely on this claim, and they explain to you that maybe you could overcome fault based lawsuits, but both as CEO of AI and the, as DLO pointed out, there is no explanation for why, in the first instance, you would want to misdeploy AI, given there are other incentives, like things like your reputation disincentive to do so, beyond simply saying AI is awesome. Four reasons why we think it is likely that companies will misdeploy AI in the first place, and therefore why this policy is necessary. Firstly, I don't know the context of the market creates a unique pressure to get ahead of your competition and deploy AI as quickly as possible. That's because there is a, you know, there is a finite pool of venture capital, particularly at the current time that investors are deeply interested in AI. Look at, for instance, the share price of Nvidia skyrocketing. So you want to be, for example, the first airline to adopt AI at its pricing, so you get investors to help you develop that going forward. But I would note, especially in the context of this, is you want to get the data in order to develop your AI ahead of your competitors. So that's to say, in order for you to get your AI better over time, you need to be the first one to go into the market and get the data with which you can train your AI because it is naturally monopolistic. Once one company is able to train their AI with the data on the whole market, their advantage snowballs over time because their AI is so much better than everyone else's. Secondly, obviously you just save money by getting your, like not putting checks and balances in your deployment of the AI, so you want to develop it quickly. And this is quite important. 
getting the data with which to train your AI is deeply, deeply expensive. Oftentimes you have to pay data brokers for it or you have to license it out. Or for instance, getting the, tech, the expertise in order to test the AI in detail is just really expensive. Thirdly, uh, and, and this deals with the uh, OG's failure to respond to the reputational argument, it's easy to deflect blame to the AI manufacturer because of the you know, entanglement of licensing agreements between you, for instance, the law firm deploying the AI and the person who you purchased or you know, bought the right uh, to uh, get that AI from in response to closing off the KI. And fourthly, the actual reason why AI is, is, is so volatile in this case is because you don't know until you deploy it how it's going to react. So that's to say, because the, the, you know, machine learning requires the data in order for it to improve over time, the first time that you deploy AI uh, in the actual market, for instance, when you're doing your pricing or when you're actually using it for the task it is designed for, that is the instance that you don't know where to respond, that is the instance that the consumers are at risk, that explains, the, fills the gap in opening up in space, and I think neatly beats them on, on, you know, by on, on unlocking most of their impacts. Next, let's talk about AI development. So firstly, why do we think AI, actually before I do that, I'll take the point. Sure, can you please explain why companies should be responsible for harms that they did not cause and are not at fault for? Yeah, so the first note I would make about this is I think we do impose a principal burden on people to hedge against risk all the time, regardless of whether like, they have a responsibility to their consumers to ensure that the product is safe. So that's to say in the same way that for instance, like when you design a kid's toy, you have a, whole, a bunch of responsibilities to make that even if the kid uses it in like, a really stupid way, uh, they don't suffer harm from it. In this instance, it is a reasonable risk that we know consumers may use AI in poor ways, and we think it is a fine thing to place the moral burden on the company to prevent consumers from doing that at the point at which they are giving the product, but I'll also explain how the moral benefit we will gain from AI development went over that principle in seven. Firstly, why is AI development the most important thing in the space? I, I, personally, I hate to say it, but it's just like more upstream and more causally important of other impacts in this debate, because the rest of the debate relies on the instance in which AI fucks up or goes wrong, we don't explain it is more likely to do this in opposition bench. But secondly, it obviously just has the biggest other impacts in the debate. Obviously, the development of AI is a very large turning point in the world. It has enormous potential to do harm or good, to be deeply redistributive or deeply regressive, to do things like solve the biggest problems of our day, we will explain that those solutions are better under our side and are less likely to backfire. But thirdly, I would note it specifically does weigh over the opening opposition principle because we will explain even if there is a potential moral wrong proven by them, we think it is a morally appropriate and worthy trade-off to make in exchange for the moral good, good that we will do in the world in terms of AI. Firstly, the first, there are two reasons why AI development gets better under our or two like parts of this argument. The first is to say, we think you now have more integration of companies who are later down the AI supply chain, i.e. the companies to whom AI is licensed out to, and the AI designers. So this looks like knowledge sharing between law firms and the AI designer working together to produce an AI that is particularly good at law. Or for instance, knowledge sharing between the medical researchers who deploy their AI and the AI designers. Other in instances like booking systems or HR firms or design firms who use the AI. Why does this not happen now? Firstly, I know it is a collective action problem. That is to say, law firm AI doesn't have an incentive to work with open AI because they have a really big, it's a very big cost to them to do so. They have to send in all of their best lawyers to work with open AI. But also, once they have done that, open AI are only going to do that if that they could profit off that technology by licensing it out to other law firms. Because it's not good enough for open AI to develop their law AI and just license it out to one law firm. Secondly, it's just very difficult. You need people who are really good at multiple things. You need people who are good at medicine and who know how AI works. People who are very good at law and who know how AI works. Those people are few and far to come by, which explains why it's a very high cost. And thirdly, you're, you, have, you risk giving up secrets about how your industry works. So that's to say, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you don't want to work with open AI to improve their, their, their medical or like other AI companies to improve their medical AI because you are giving up a competitive advantage that you have over your opponents. Why does this change on the outside? We just massively increase the burden placed on these firms. So that's to say now, if you're a law firm, if you want to get the benefits of AI, you're forced to work with the AI designers in order to ensure that AI doesn't fuck up when you do your legal research because you'll be held liable for it. So this gets much more integration of the AI supply chain, which explains that you're less likely to have your medical research go wrong. It explains that you're less likely to make a, 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 a mistake which costs people billions of dollars. It explains that when the AI is doing the environmental calculations for how climate change will affect the world, they get it correct as opposed to wrong because the incentive is insufficient, as I've explained. The final reason why AI development changes under our side, under our side is because it is 
necessary to pull the risk in the inference that AI goes wrong, such that AI developers do not bear full liability. That is to say, if you are a company like, for instance, like OpenAI AI, or I guess in this case, Microsoft, you are making a product that does have enormous potential to go wrong. So there is a massive, massive chance that a lawsuit, if you are finding fault, will just destroy your company or will send an AI, uh, will send you bankrupt. Whereas on the outside, when we pull the risk and everyone in the supply chain has to bear liability for that, that burden is no longer disproportionately placed on the AI manufacturers. And that burden allows them to do more risky types of AI development, which is actually where we get the highest like, impact in terms of developing AI that really changes the world, because you're willing to take those risks. But secondly, it also avoids a scenario where AI developers, AI company goes bankrupt because they get hit with a lawsuit, because something did go wrong, we think that's very good. For all those reasons, proud to discuss. I'd like to welcome the opposition member to open the closing half. characterize what kinds of operations that have AI integrated into them that are punished most by this. A question backwardly not targeted by any team. I'm going to explain the three steps first. We shall punish the use of AI that is at the point of the user experience versus when the use of AI is suited to the view. For example, medical imaging technology where ultimately the decision is overridden by a doctor and the doctor is accountable for that decision. Comparing that, for example, to like a, a company using it to help people like missing appointments, right? Where it's clearly at the user experience. Secondly, that it will punish newer entrants to the AI market who want to integrate it with less capital reserves to take the cost of no fault insurance, who will just avoid doing it in the first place. And that will explain that there are two consequences of this. First, and maybe dealing with some of these extensions, it's too bad for AI development to massively fuck the market competitiveness of AI that is targeted at making user experiences and front end AI better at the expense of things that are back end, then where use people can't see. AI less clearly, because that is where the biggest benefits of AI lie, to make businesses much more profitable, to make governments have the capacity to distribute welfare to people quickly when they have little capacity with their own bureaucracies to do so. That is the form of AI that development should be prioritized the most, and that is where this should fuck it the most. But thirdly, we'll explain that this consolidates the AI market because it shrinks the possible uses of it, it shrinks the amount of companies that are using it, which would be bad for the regulation of AI and bad for the overall trajectory development. If I've got time, I'll do a bloody talk on Google too. Let's do that characterization though. No, I think government make an interesting concession in the dying moments of PM when they correct the argument this leads to higher costs of services on consumers. Lila says, well, it's not even that, it's central. Taking this claim to its logical conclusion would lead you to believe that many operations will simply stop using AI because it's not that essential and that therefore the claim that they made open in government is that just doesn't matter, so you know, we don't care if it's not that important. That's their implicit claim. But that is, in fact, unproven and disastrous. This punishes the most visible instances of AI at the point of the consumer experiences. Because that's where people are aware that AI is causative in the harm that they are experiencing and they want remedy. And that is where there are going to be the most amount of cases that are lodged against companies that use AI. Again, contrast this to a doctor using an AI like a medical imaging or an ECG interpretation service that helps them make a decision they ultimately legally take on as their own. It says, oh, you know, it could be a heart attack. Then you read it yourself and you say, I also think that's a hard attack. I agree with the AI. Like, that's far less likely that the person yes. making the case that the harm has happened to them knows that AI has been a part of it. Compare this, for example, to a company using it to help them make appointments or a driverless car or something like that, where it's clearly the AI is much more at the point of the user experience. That means that the operations that have their use punished by this, that are most likely to stop using AI, are the ones where it is not geared at improving the user experiences. But also, it punishes startup operations using AI the most because they don't have the capital to spend showing up a huge cost that they're incurring. If they characterize at open government as a huge fixed cost, maybe they could have improved the AI, but really they're not big enough to bother to deal with that. So they just say, okay, we're not going to bother using AI in our core operation. We'll hire our staff to do it. We won't use the AI for it. Maybe very large conglomerates can cop the costs of you know, a bunch of people like just claiming things and instantly getting money from their insurance and the insurance that they have to pay into. But if they're an adult and use of AI, they probably will not, especially if they don't have the capital to invest in that. 
So disproportionately, it's visible use of the AI, and disproportionately, Point. it punishes the smaller and smaller operations because it's too advanced. So that's for AI development. It signals to the market that AI development is the least com com competitive and profitable forms of AI exist at the user experience, and disincentivizes people from investing in the development of those enormously because they either won't be used by the companies they're intended to be used for, or they will not end up like ever actually being deployed, so why would you fucking Point. bother researching and making those things better? This doesn't touch back-end technologies, like I described with medical imaging and things that OG situate very good impacts in. This is very bad because first, these are the best forms of AI that have the potential to shape people's lives enormously. At scale, AIs like this that are targeted at making user experiences and engaging with services better could be used by governments to distribute welfare programs where their bureaucracies Point. are enormously inefficient. For example, countries like India, where there are billions of people requiring government services, but there simply aren't bureaucracies to do that. A awesome and really well-developed AI for that can be used at that kind of scale that was developed and was prioritized by the market would be an enormous good, but that would be deprioritized by the market. Those kinds of AIs would never be deployed at scale. Those kinds of things would never be good enough to be deployed at scale, which would be disastrous. But secondly, it reduces the average person interaction with AI because it happens far less at the point of their user experience with AI, which is equitable in this debate, whether you know AI is good or bad, but no team's abolishing AI, right? Like the opening government assumption in this debate is that they assume that public pressure to regulate AI by you know individual citizens on the government is something that's freestanding and not altered by this debate. But if you interact with AI far less in your life, and that's it's clearly true that your incentives to care about whether that's well regulated, whether governments have invested in altering algorithms that you ultimately can't see and don't feel like affect your user experience with technology at all, massively decreases, which means public pressure and scrutiny on AI development massively also decreases, which is disastrous, uh, which means AI development and regulation get far worse. Over here, John. If a company can't integrate AI in a way that's safe, they shouldn't. We explain why premature entry into the AI market is harmful, even if it would diversify the companies that use it. No, but it's not correlated with whether or not it's safe or not. It's whether or not you can cop the cost, which just does not neatly correlate to whether or not it's safe or not. Because like you characterize as a fixed cost, you have to make a decision whether the trade-off is worth it. Sometimes if you're a small company, you don't. If you've got a user-oriented one, or you're gonna have lots and lots of claims made against you, even if that's relatively safe, you want to do that. Clearly not a burden you've established. Point. This has also an effect on competition. The other consequence of this policy is on like how many a, like different AI development companies exist. This policy, by virtue of what I've already explained, constricts the kind of AI that is perceived as a point of development to be profitable. It also decreases the variety of companies that have a meaningful and profitable reason to integrate AI into their operations at scale, which would constrict the AI market enormously, who it's being sold to, and what can ultimately be sold profitably, consolidates AI development into far fewer companies, into far fewer users, which creates far more of an oligopoly, which is harmful because AI companies are able to be much less transparent with their algorithms and how they're developed, especially at the back end, and are able to resist efforts by governments because with their oligopolistic sale, they can simply collude and say, no, we won't be transparent with you. We will withdraw and cause huge economic shocks when we withdraw from vital operations, and that would be disastrous, which means there would be far less scrutiny by governments and far less ability by governments to scrutinize what is done by companies that use AI. And that will also mean that the costs of things that use AI will massively increase because there's natural, naturally less competition. For that reason, there's far less good development of AI for the AIs that we think are uncontroversially good. And there's far less competition in the AI market to make it better, to make it more oriented towards users, which is ultimately what AI should be for. For that reason, it's zero.
looking at the other details of anything, you then need to do the consulting for yourself. Firstly, your house name. We explain to you firstly, we explain actually why these companies are bad, why AI is inherently volatile and trying to break things. But secondly, we explain to you why not only is there a lack of a disincentive, that is our opening tries to claim that, oh, the like, lawsuits don't work and functionally that's why people are going to do as well. We explain to you the actual reasons why AI has a massive incentive to do things that would result in volatility like lack of new research, like wanting to enter this market far sooner, which results in people not doing things like filtering through their data and doing more testing, which would result in a better development of AI. Furthermore, we explain to you that people don't blame the AI company themselves, but the people that are using it. So the person who is causing it to you when AI harms you isn't OpenAI who developed the initial software, but it's the law firm that implemented it in a way that would meaningfully hurt your life. That then explains and overcomes their analysis around reputational incentives, because their claim is like, oh, when you win a lawsuit, your reputational incentive disappears. But no, we explain to you instead that uh, a more reasonable and common reason, which is just to say that you misplaced the reputational harm onto someone that didn't initially develop the AI in a way that was volatile. Now then, our next extension was about development, explaining why there is more integration and sharing, why there is more knowledge sharing that doesn't happen on the opposition bench. The weight of this, I think, is quite clear. That is to say that AI is an inevitable part of the human future. We ought to make sure that it does not, uh, like, that it does so in the best way possible, and it does so as soon as possible. We explain to you why development is accelerated, why the final result of AI will be far better on our side when you engage in this kind of information sharing. And furthermore, responding to opening opposition here, but we, the path of AI should be effective and good. It should not be littered with the pain and suffering of individuals who are falsely fired because AI, AI, AI resulted in them being fired, looking like engineering being done completely worse because AI was implemented in the, in, in the construction of a bridge or something like that. That explains our extension, weighing them against open government. First, they talk about consumers. Two things. We explain to you why AI is volatile and poorly made, explain the meaningful harm that actually occurs to consumers, and like increase the certainty of this argument. But secondly, we explain to you why it is justified to do so, even if it is the consumer's fault. That is to say, the contestation by OO, that even if the consumer is, we explain why even if the consumer is at fault, they ought to be held liable and ought to be uh, responsible for it. Secondly, in terms of their extent, their, their claim about businesses, we explain to you firstly why they actually develop AI far better on our side. We explain why business practices are better. Furthermore, we explain why it gives a more, uh, like we explain the reputational harm of businesses in a far more clear way. That then explains why we overtake opening government. Now on, now on closing opposition. First thing to say here, first thing they say here is about market competition. Now we flip this to our mechanism that we give you at, at, at member. That is to say that risk is now shared between more actors than it is on the opposition bench. This is to say that currently it is split between the AI. Uh, on our side, it's split between the people that develop the AI and the people that implement it. Whereas on this opposition side, it's much easier for them to push that suit further up. And when they experience a lawsuit, say a class action that, like they described, they shift that towards the developer of AI. But instead, this no no this no no fault no fault process means that more individuals are responsible and share the risk overall far more collectively. And the problem here is that currently those who implement it, when they shift this to the developer, the developer goes bust. Because one individual, the one individual company cannot take this much volatility and risk in terms of their insurance. They cannot do this big of a payout. Which explains then why it is particularly important if you want market competition to share this risk in the ways that we described. Next, in terms of their claim that this only exists on the front end and you don't realize that it's on the back end. Three things. Firstly, you can't hide things forever. I think it would just come out that you were using AI in a particularly bad way. Secondly, though, if a problem did happen, if you realize that something has gone bad on our side, you can realize it on their side. You're likely to do something like a lawsuit. And when you do so, the problem here is that you just, just find it in discovery. Like AI probably is something that is clear and intuitive here. But finally, it is probably true that at some point you are just going to have to declare the fact that you use AI and AI services have to be declared, particularly when you talk about this no-fault things being put in place. Because the way in which you can hide away from the no-fault is something that would be blocked, it is something that would be implemented into this regulation to your opening. On our side, when your AI becomes safer, you pay less in premiums because you cause less problems. On your side, it's an uncertain effect because the fault is no longer a relevant factor. So clearly we would get safer AI development, not you. Wait, what? On our side, when your AI causes less people to get hurt, you pay less in premiums and No, 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 so the problem is your description of AI being dangerous is to do with it actively doing something wrong. But I think one of the more common ways in which AI can be pernicious is just the AI not being idiot proof and people using AI in malicious ways. What we are doing here is explaining why when you have no fault insurance, what happens is AI developers have to meaningfully insure and, and protect their, their products from being used in malicious ways. They need to stop it from producing things like hate speech because that would be something that they could then become at fault for. This is to say that like you need this AI to be idiot proof. 
So, because when someone uses AI poorly in a way that they were at fault, that is something where obviously you would get away from it. But the AI, then, AI company then doesn't have an incentive to stop those kind of things from happening because they are not at fault for it. They do not have to pay a fine for it. But on our side, it's far more likely that even if the per person was at fault and they did something wrong, now the AI has to meaningfully protect from that and stop things like that from happening in the future, which I think is probably the more likely way in which AI does actually mean, produ meaningfully produce harm. It's from users implementing and using the AI in a particularly wrong fashion. And there is currently not an incentive to stop this from happening because you don't have that kind of legal liability for things like this because it is the fault of the user. But we explain to you why expanding this beyond the fault of the user is something that is meaningfully good, even if it might incur some moral harm. But furthermore, I'd just like to say, as we said before, obviously this kind of moral harm is something that is applied elsewhere. Let us say guidelines on products exist to tell people how to use them correctly in ways that don't harm them. Pen lids have holes in them, so you cannot choke on them. Because obviously it would be the fault of the user if you choke on a pen lid, but obviously the person producing it should put in things so that people don't die. And I think that is a meaningful thing in this space, sure. Yeah, I plan to know that we're happy to strengthen these regulations. Why is any of this not symmetric? So the problem is that you are, but like, you, you don't meaningfully explain how you would strengthen this regulation in a way that would reduce the impact that we're describing. That is to say that we, like, obviously at some point you just strengthen the so much that you are just doing no-fault insurance in the way that we describe and not calling it insurance. I think that is kind of the screw over Now they're talking about the prices of services that open up that you can Two responses here. The first thing is to say that it might end up being more costly, but the obvious alternative to this is using humans in these practices, things like chatbots, which suggests that even if it's slightly more costly, there is still a net decrease in prices for consumers, so the margin of delta here is small. Second thing here is I'd like to, I'd, I'd ask you to weigh this against the quality of these services. If they saw a meaningfully increase in prices, it is unclear why you would weigh that against the potential harms that we described to you. The final thing here is to say that it is unclear if this would be a meaningful tipping point for people actually engaging in the use of these services. That is to say that AI, even if it becomes slightly more costly due to insurance premiums, is still something that's hugely effective. Humans are quite costly. Humans are quite slow. They sleep, things like that. Which then explains why it is far more likely that you still shift away and you still get all of the development benefits that we talk to you. At the end of this speech, I think it's quite conclusive. We explain that AI currently is bad, has a set of problems, and the current situation, the current legislation, the legislation they describe, is not enough to overcome those problems. For those reasons, proud to go. I'd like to thank the government whip for that speech and would love to invite up the opposition whip to close out the semi final round. <laughs>
they have been resolved at the point it is paid out, which means you don't get meaningful recourse under their side. So the two premises that OG's claim is reliant, uh, case is reliant upon simply do not hold up. All right, yes, um, the additional claim that they make is like the signaling effect of now if no fault is the default, everyone assumes that AI companies are at fault. I think it is the absolute inverse of it, right? If in every single instance of someone misusing AI, the AI company has to pay them out, why would you ever assume that the AI was bad and not just like, oh, this is just kind of what happens? You don't have court cases which illustrate the actual harm that AI companies are capable of perpetrating such that you don't get the reputational damage under their side, on you there. do get it under our side. I think OG is out of this debate. I'm going to move on to CG in a second, actually, before I do, I'll give OG a chance to respond. Um, yeah, getting a payout is recourse and compensation that's far preferable because it's immediate and doesn't incur the hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal costs. Why is that insufficient? Um, because, like, sometimes you, you can't pay, like, sometimes a single payout, which is likely not to be, obviously, doing a lot of them for a company would be a lot, but an individual payout probably isn't as significant as you could achieve in a class action lawsuit. Something, sometimes that compensation simply isn't enough. And additionally, I, like, all the hurdles that OO put to about having to prove that you access that compensation in the first place still exist. I don't think it's as easy as you suggest. Now, let's talk about CG. They have two claims. The first is that AI is developed poorly. First thing I'll note is that, like, obviously you have a ton of incentives to develop AI well in the status quo, but reputationally, because competitively there are lots of different AI companies, such that you want your AI to be good and functional. But the second thing to say is that I think AI development just gets worse under their side. Firstly, you can't beta test as well, because you are liable for your beta test going poorly, right? Because now there's no fault, uh, because this applies to that as well. Why would you ever test it on a smaller market if you don't think it's going to be perfect? Secondly, you are chilled out of deployment or out of development overall because now fewer companies want to engage in a more diverse way with smaller scale AI companies in particular. Thirdly, now like you don't have data as to where the AI, whether the AI was at fault or not, because now it is suggested that they are, it has always been at fault, which means that you don't get data on where AI is failing in a meaningful way. So you cannot feed that into that um, uh, machine and have it learn better. But fourthly, you cannot meaningfully regulate the way that AI is Point. used and is deployed in the way that I've just described. But additionally, because now you consolidate oligopolies, so they have lobbying power such that you can't regulate the way that AI is developed. Because the public doesn't scrutinize AI in the way that Oscar explains, and because of the same mechanisms I just gave from OG, which is as to why you don't get things like class action lawsuits and proper regulation. So, I don't think AI is developed fully on our side, it's developed far worse under theirs. Sorry, I might just put my time up quickly if that's okay. <coughs> Sorry, I hope that don't take that as persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I put it at five ten. Is that yeah? All right. The second claim that CG make is that this makes development better because now companies are able to integrate their knowledge into the AI because they share responsibility. I think the first response here is to say that I just have no idea why a company would refuse to work with an AI that they were then going to use in their business if, like, why this would be a tipping point, right? Because why would a law firm use a law AI that they had no knowledge of the back end of in the first place? I just think a lot of companies probably don't opt into using AI, especially now if they are agreeing to take on liability for the AI. Surely it's just far more likely that they just don't use it in the first place. But secondly, obviously there's already a huge incentive to be involved early on in the development of AI. Like, look at Microsoft and OpenAI. Now Microsoft can tell OpenAI what to develop, and then they get to have specific input into it. They get exclusive input into it. I just don't understand why that incentive to have input into the technology that you're using doesn't already exist. This seems like a bit of a strange extension. So, at the end of that, I just don't think the claims CG makes about AI being developed particularly poorly, or about there being now this newfound incentive to integrate yourself better into AI exists. I think it's all largely symmetric, if not gets worse on their side. Quickly on OO, I think OO correctly identified the moral harm which exists in this debate, which I, to be fair, don't think either dub team overcomes. However, what we explain is that AI is good, it should be improved, and that this precludes it improving. I think the impact we have on this debate is by far the deepest, because it is the impact that people experience in their everyday interactions with AI into, not just now, to be clear, but into the future. Because all of the comments I'm making about, or sorry, all of the arguments I'm offering about AI improving now are true, certainly, in the status quo. But going into the future, the more restrictive the data that we have on AI is, the less people use AI, the worse and worse it becomes. The only way AI, this inevitable beast that is kind of like slowly crawling up on us, can be used uh, in a utile way is if it is used with uh, uh, openly and by many people with as much data going into it as possible, as transparently as possible. The only world that that takes place in is the world closing 
opposition. So we're